at the end of the day, you know, we are we are in a client uh, client business, and uh, I mean, at Rothschild and Co, we look after a few clients. Um, I think on average we look after about 30 clients uh, compared to another bank where it might be about 10 times that. So naturally we have more time uh, per client and we can establish uh, deeper relationships. So that's why I don't mind, you know, uh, calling uh, on weekends because over time, you know, you know, the client well, you know, there are he, his or her uh, wealth, uh, investments, family. And so I think the whole thing becomes you know, less, less work and more and more fun, actually. Welcome back to another edition here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Falco Beccali. Well, today we're going to look at a very traditional, one of the most important banks in Europe, Rothschild and Co. Rothschild has been around for over 200 years and believe it or not, it was actually funded and created in Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, the gentleman that funded it was Meir Amsher Rothschild and we, together with his five sons, he really built an empire. Today, I'm really, really honored because I have Laurent Gagnebin with me and he is the CEO of Rothschild and Co. Bank here based in Zurich. Laurent, thank you so much for being with us here on the show on Mentory TV. Thank you for having me. But I, I tell you one thing, looking at the entire history of the family itself, where it was funded, the way it was created and spread out, and the kind of banking that Rothschild is involved, it's extremely traditional. And of course, the first question in my mind is, we have gone through such an evolution, revolution, if nothing else, where you know the banking sector, the private banking sector needs to kind of balance the technolo technological advances with the actual true value of a traditional bank like Rothschild. How do you do that? Well, I mean, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Um, in a way, the, the business has not changed. You know, we still look after people. Uh, the, there is still uh, emotion attached to, to money, to investments. People have families. They want to look after their, their kids, their their uh, partners, uh, but at the same time, I think the communication channel has changed, and uh, it's now a lot more hybrid. Uh, they want to be able to have access to, uh, you know, to their accounts whenever they want, uh, whenever they want, wherever they are. Uh, they want to send you an email to to chat to you over the cell phone, you know, to 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 speak to you on the Sunday morning. But um, at the end of the day, you know, it, it remains, you know, people, uh, humans, and they want to get a, a feeling uh, of, you know, what, what you think about the investment. And I think that, you know, that will never be, be replaced by, by technology, in my opinion. I think that people still want to have a, a person uh, at the end of the day where they can uh, speak to and that they know that they will look after their, their wealth. Yeah, I like that. I mean, if you look at the client portfolio, you actually have successful businesses, high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth individuals, foundations, they might have a different approach, of course, and the person wants to be seen and heard. However, you mentioned the hybrid, you know, the hybrid approach. Tell us a little bit more what it actually means on a day to day basis. Um, I think it's, um, you know, it's a, uh, a combination of, of human and, and computer. So on, on the bank side, you know, we rely uh, more and more, I think, on tools, on uh, artificial intelligence, on systems uh, to, to help us manage, uh, you know, maturities of, of bonds, uh, new ideas, uh, new, uh, new uh, interesting areas of, of investments, mm -hmm. but also in the way we deliver the, uh, the information to the client, it becomes more and more, uh, com you know, computer-based emails, uh, VCs, um, you know, Zoom, like, like we are having right now. Um, so I think it's just a, a combination of, uh, of both. And I think that both cannot live uh, by themselves. I think both go together. Yeah, I actually think that technology enhances the proximity. I mean, if you, you just said earlier on, you know, they call you on a Sunday morning. Do you really want to be called on a Sunday morning? It doesn't matter how many billions the guy has with you, but maybe not. So technology can really actually establish and continue to build close relationships with your clients. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we are we are in a client uh, client business, and uh, I mean, at Rothschild and Co, we look after few clients. Um, I think on average we look after about thirty clients, uh, compared to another bank where it might be about ten times that. So naturally, we have more time uh, per client, and we can establish a uh, deeper relationships. So that's why I don't mind, you know, uh, calling uh, on weekends because over time, you know, you know the client well, you know their he, his or her uh, wealth, uh, investments, family, and so I think the whole thing becomes you know, less, less work and more and more fun, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is the kind of family office feeling you get as a client there as well. Um, but uh, in, in general, before we dive into the three uh, individual pillars of the bank, which what, what it really focuses on for its clients, give us a little bit of a, you know, status quo of how Rothschild and Co. really navigated through what's been happening over the last almost two years and continues to happen, be it on uh, the pandemic level, be it on the economic level, what's happening right now as well and also how you kind of manage to keep the team together in times where you could not um, keep the team together physically um, I think we were all um, quite surprised actually by the uh, you know by the speed of, uh, of what happened so um, you know we started to, to hear about what's going on in China and then it, it was quite contained and suddenly it started to, to spread out um, and then you know we started to see what was going on in Italy, and then we realized quite quickly it would go um, you know much further than than that. So um, on the IT side, we were quick at um, you know ordering new servers, new I new computers. Uh, so by the time we had the lockdown here in Switzerland, we had already installed all the new uh, all the new servers, and we were actually ready uh, on day one to uh, to send everybody home, which was a big advantage because. We could service our clients, uh, you know, quite well from home. And there was a lot of volatility, a lot of uh, anxiety from our clients. You know, markets were going down. So it was not an easy, uh, an easy period. Um, so we had to, to manage all the, all the bank from home. And we also uh, then decided um, very quickly to, um, to put management meetings every morning, uh, every day from, you know, for, for an hour. To, to basically manage the, the bank in a bit of a crisis, uh, crisis mode. Um, and we also decided that the, to keep the team together, as you, as you said, would, would be a challenge because, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, young employees who might be living in a, in a flat with other people. Uh, we have young couples with, with kids. Um, you know, if you if you are alone in your house, it's easier. But if you are, you know, uh, with, with a small family in a, a studio, it's it's harder. So we also made sure that we over communicated uh, with people. We're telling them what's going on, what will happen, what you know, things we have put in place to to help them uh, on the uh, on the technology side. We tried not to you know over promise um, things. But we, we were, I think, quite, um, you know, quite uh, transparent from, from the start. And we really made an effort to over-communicate. I think there is no uh, over-communication uh, in this type of, uh, of crisis. And uh, we were actually happy because we, we received uh, um, an award from, from Wells Briefing on this internal communication that we did at that period because we really went uh, quite, quite far also with our clients. If it's... Uh, overboard. Definitely on a Sunday yes. morning included. <laughs> But I think this is so pertinent what you're saying there um, is really the, the, the leadership role. Uh, you know, you're taking responsibility for that kind of situation and over communications. Like when you when some you sit in the airplane, right, and you're not you're not moving, and nobody talks to you, and you just go, okay, so what's happening? We should be, and that yes. is exactly the point that creates in that in, in insecure environment even more insecurity or even upset. Um, and I think, uh, do you actually think that your leadership role, I don't want to say has matured over the time, but somehow shifted during that experience? Um, I mean, I think we all learned a lot um, during that period because uh, especially our, our generation, we've had a, a pretty nice uh, ride, frankly, uh, compared to our grandparents who had uh, 
wars, uh, wars, etc. At least in uh, in Switzerland. Um, so I think that we are certainly confronted with with things that we had not imagined. You know, I had not imagined that I would be able to go to the you know, to, to London or to the US for, for a few years that I wouldn't be able to take a, a plane almost for, for, uh, more, for more than a year. Um, so I think, you know, we, we were suddenly confronted with that. I was very fortunate that I have a good team around me um, so I think the the executive committee of, of the bank is, is very good, and ha- we have good specialists in every field. So I could really rely on uh, on the team. So for for me, you know, uh, I felt good um, across the pandemic because I, I knew that from the investment side we're uh, in in a good shape. You know, we have a good COO, we have a good head of HR, we have a good head of compliance. So I I knew that we were going to to do pretty well. Um, and also, uh, you know, the, the, I think it really cemented the team uh, throughout this this crisis. So I think now we are more, you know, uh, we are a better team now that we used to be two years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, a crisis makes or breaks you. Absolutely, absolutely. And as you were saying, you know, I, I can only imagine in this kind of business where you look after individuals, your clients as well, apart from your team, but your clients, and they are so unsure about what is happening. I think the model that Rothschild and Co. has of having less than 30 clients per advisor is quite unique. I mean, when I stumbled over that, I thought like, wow. That is really very individual, and you do have a few thousand clients. So it's a, you yes. know, it's it's a it, that and this kind of proximity then aided through technology is really important. Let's talk a little bit more. Um, about- if, I, if I may just add, uh, Patricia, I, I think we also all learned more about our clients. So, you know, in this in this type of crisis, you learn much better uh, to understand your clients and, you know, you may have discussed volatility and what could have happened in a 9-11 type scenarios on the portfolios. And, you know, you, you could have done Monte Carlo simulation. But actually, leaving a crisis, you learn a lot more about the the risk tolerance of your of your clients. So I was surprised uh, in in sometimes in in both ways. So uh, some clients I sought, and they had told us that they would stomach a higher volatility. I realized that they were not uh, so brave when the market was going down. And other clients who I would have thought that they would be more challenged with the volatility actually you know uh, remain calm throughout the uh, throughout the crisis so i think also from our point of view we learned a lot more about our clients that's quite amazing a lot of leaders uh, say that to me also about their teams where you know the crisis really just showed that you know the macho not being that macho after all and vice versa all of a sudden the gray mouse go like okay just do it <laughs> like, okay, fine. no it's it is it's been a learning curve definitely and looking at where to find um, value and really performance. I mean, y- you mentioned there, in a nutshell, resilience from some of your clients, resilience of the bank. Uh, on the other hand, of course, you want to have capital not only preserved with Rothschild and Co., you want it growing. And the three main businesses you have is global advisory, wealth and asset management, and merchant yeah. banking. Talking, first of all, a bit more top down, the resilience of these three legs. What was the best performer in, let's say, 2020? I looked at your latest reports. There was also a little bit of a difference between the different uh, business areas uh so in 2020 um you know the uh the wealth management did uh did well uh so did the uh, global advisory because global advisory we had uh, we have you know two two parts we have the uh mna side and then we have the debt restructuring uh side so what happened is back in spring um, suddenly, a lot of uh, companies became worried about their their balance sheets, and they needed help um, on the debt side. For example, in hospitality industry, um, you know, airlines um, they really need needed to you know quick quick help. So we're able to service this uh, you know this part of the uh, uh, economy that was really hit hard by the by the uh, pandemic. Needed the cash, needed the cash flow, and quick. 
Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, so we shifted some some people from M&A to, uh, to debt restructuring. And then what happened is that suddenly, you know, when people realized that it was going to be, uh, you know, not back to normal quickly, but he, the, the market rebounded quite fast. You had a lot of companies who wanted to take advantage of the crisis through M&A. So uh, um, our M&A colleagues also became suddenly quite, uh, quite uh, busy with the winners of the pandemic, you know, technology, uh, for example, um, you know, streaming media, etc. Um, so actually, the the investment banking uh, franchise has done uh, also uh, very well. What hasn't done well uh, in 2020 was our merchant banking uh, um, uh, division. Not because the the portfolio suffered. In fact, you know, we're invested in you know the winners. I would say of the of the pandemic, but we just decided that we would not do any exit. Because we felt that you know the the, the valuation would uh, would not uh, be what it should be, so we we delayed a lot of the exit um, to twenty twenty one, and that's why we had uh, so far a very good year because we were able to sell some of the companies um, that we would have sold in twenty twenty otherwise. Yes, uh, let's get a little bit deeper into the merchant banking side, uh, pri- you know, into the private market side, because I, I, you know, being in that business myself, together also with our partnership Falco Capital, uh, I, I, we saw the same thing. I mean, of course, mm-hmm. you, you do have a certain you know hold in value creation. Why should you chuck it out at that point? On the other hand, you know, having a certain cash potentially cash cash situation, you could not really or only up to a certain limit make use of good valuations in the market. Uh, so, so buying was also a little bit tedious because of yeah. uncertainty. Now, now I wonder how, uh, what is the process actually that you offer to your private client to get into private markets, which is a totally different breed to just having the usual stocks and bonds or even, you know, in, in investing into art. Yeah, I think that uh, private market is going, I mean, has become more important also because of the drop of, of interest rates and people not getting uh, what they used to be getting on their bond uh, portfolio. I think it has become uh, a lot more important uh, to people. I think that clients enjoy it. Uh, they feel uh, you know, more of an attachment to a private company than to a listed uh, stock that they have in their, um, in their portfolio. I also think that it's uh, it has a benefit to an investor because you cannot sell. So when I mentioned before that you know some clients sold in in March because they they were a bit you know uh, under under stress, I think that having invested in private uh, market is actually has a benefit to you because you're forced to stay uh, to stay invested. So at uh, at Rothschild and Co, we offer. Um, you know, you're basically access to European companies on the private equity or on the private debt side where we lend money to private companies. I think the difference here is that we always co-invest alongside our clients. So we tend to put approximately 20% of uh, our own money into each deal uh, and each fund that we uh, propose to our clients. So I think the uh, you know, the offering uh, is very different because we sit on the same side than uh, our clients. You know, if we make money, our clients make money. And if they lose money, we also lose money. So the, our clients like the fact that they can co-invest alongside the, the Rothschild family, the partners and the group. Uh, and they like this alignment of interest that is actually, in our opinion, quite hard to, quite hard to find nowadays. No, I think this makes a big difference. It would make a big difference to me as a potential co-investor together with the Rothschild family. And uh, has, this, has this always been part of the investment uh, strategy that the family invests and then invites some of the clients? Or is it fairly new, especially when it comes to the startup scene? Um, so we, we've always uh, invested uh, on our own. Um, and then I would say probably about... 10, 15 years ago, um, we uh, decided to open this to our uh, to our clients because we felt that there was a need um, from our client to invest in private markets. We realized that we had been doing it for ourselves for 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 a while, 
and and you know we thought that it would uh, be a good idea to offer this to our clients. Um, so we tend to um, to invest in um, yeah, in a bit more grown up uh, companies, not so much VC, but you know profitable companies. We started to offer in Switzerland access to uh, you know to earlier stage companies. Um, because also we have a need from, from clients who, as I mentioned, you know, have seen um, an increase in Switzerland of, uh, of startups, especially around Lausanne and uh, Zurich, around the universities, and they want to have access uh, to, these, uh, to this deal, but they don't have the network, they don't have the, 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 the deal sourcing capabilities uh, that we can uh, bring, bring, uh, bring them. No, I think uh, I went to one of your events there, uh, and you do also have a uh, a link up with um, Venture Kick, I think, here in Switzerland. And Correct. I thought it was so yeah, no, it was so well organized, um, where you know I had the pitching sessions for us uh, investors, even you know whatever investor was at at the table. It was very well organized, and I, I wonder to to what extent do you actually do the due diligence, and do you take responsibility before your clients co invest? So if we if, if we invest ourselves, uh, naturally we 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 go through a you know a deep due diligence um, of, of the company. Um, we will explain to our clients why we like this company, uh, what are the risks, what are the uh, the opportunities, you know what type of uh, valuation we we're entering into the companies, you know what kind of exit uh, we would expect. Um, and I think that's really one of the benefits from, from our clients is that they can benefit from our due diligence uh, when, we, when we invest in, um, in, in private companies. And, uh, you know, the due diligence is pretty, uh, is pretty intense. And we also rely on our investment banking colleagues because we have experts in, uh, in healthcare and in technology, in, in real estate, uh, and we can speak to them and say, hey, you know, what, what do, you, uh, do you know this company? What do you think about it? What do you think about the sector? You know, what do you think about the risks? What could go wrong? Uh, and so I think that um, that's also a big advantage of, of ourselves uh, because we have access to, you know, to, to our colleagues from, from investment banking. And we also uh, often uh, include our clients because we have clients that are experts in in a field so if we have i don't know a technology uh i mean a client who maybe uh uh it's it's well in, in technology we would add, ask the client you know do you know this company what do you think you know do you want to co-invest with us um so i think it, it's kind of a, a good ecosystem of that we have. yeah it's reciprocity uh, re there's a reciprocity uh, as they say re reciprocity if i can <laughs> get the word out um but i i like that you just have to watch out that your client that gives you that kind of advice <laughs> doesn't charge you then said okay i'm gonna come into the deal but at a discount no i like this the reason why i'm asking so much is of course a i'm in the field or we are in the field um together with our partnership on one hand but on the other hand we get more and more potential co-investors wanting to go in this from the family office and you know from the family office uh, realm simply because they actually get asked more and more by their clients you know i wouldn't mind going a little bit more into the private market but the private market is risky i mean if you yes. look at the failure rate especially venture capital startup even scale-up companies they tend to fail i think uh, the latest i read is like 93 percent just go bust full stop and not necessarily necessarily at the beginning, but, you know, even towards maturity, if you can call it like that, towards eight, nine, 10 years of existing simply because, you know, the market has shifted, they haven't shifted uh, or, or the structure of the company is not solid enough or whatever reason. So, you know, to have, I, I love that about Orchard, that you went into that being such a traditional bank, being very much about, you know, asset, wealth manager, pre management, preservation, but at the same time offering this kind of thing. Do you think that, you know, the successes of, let's say, uh, Google, Amazon, you know, all the, the FANG stocks in general, these, the generation of uh, producing unicorn after unicorn is something that now even conservative investors are licking their fingers for? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the, you know, these, these companies that you, that you mentioned have become, uh, in a way, um, consumer staples. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that 
the new generation would, would rather uh, skip a meal than um, you know not pay uh, the Netflix uh, subscription for a uh, for for a month or not get the the new uh, the new iPhone. Um, so I think it's really become part of uh, uh, you know our everyday life. Um, I think we would struggle to live uh, without uh, Apple and and Google um, for for months, uh, frankly. Just like we would struggle to live without uh, Nestle food. Uh, for four months. So I think it's really, uh, it has definitely, uh, um, you know, brought technology uh, to, you know, to every investor's uh, portfolio. Absolutely, to the forefront. Let's talk a little bit about megatrends because that is something that when I sit down with you or your inv- advisors, Laurent, I wonder, you know, I want to know how do you see the world? I know. And, and at the moment, yeah, you know, the latest, the latest news and everybody thinks, you know, property is something safe, but then we have Evergrande and China really maybe, you know, creating the next Lehman moment. We have inflation. And, and I think today, even the, the, the Fed is meeting on interest rates, tapering, you know, tapering. So as so many, you know, potential risk factors, where do you see the mega trends where you always go, okay, we can actually be long-term investors with you? Um, I mean, I'm a, an optimistic by by nature. So, and you you will always have risks uh, in 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 the in the horizon. Um, so, I think there is probably more geopolitical risk now than there was, uh, you know, uh, two three years ago. Um, there is a risk of uh, tapering, so less less liquidity in in the system. But you know, we believe that if you invest in the long term. Uh, into good companies with with good cash flows and companies that reinvest con, um, in their business at a, at a higher multiple of investment uh, invested capital, you know the compounding over time uh, in the long term is you know is the way to to invest. So we tend to you know to invest in blue chips uh, in a fairly concentrated portfolio, probably 20, 25 stocks that you know everybody does well. Uh, everybody knows that the company will do well for the future, and from time Time to time, you know, you will have something, uh, an opportunity, like we had in in uh, March uh, 2020 when the market drops. Suddenly, you can buy, you know, very nice names uh, at a very attractive valuation. Um, and I think this this is a moment that you you have to put your your cash at work, uh, and and not be afraid of of buying you know good names that you you would you would want. But it's true that we also have now more uh, you know more technology than we used to have. 10, 10 years ago. Um, and, because our world know, we, is like that, Laurent. I mean, I don't think it's anything to apologize for. I, I mean, any any company, any bank that doesn't go with the mega trends, and this is why I'm asking you, Laurent, yeah. will be just left behind. You know, so yes. it, is, it is really what we started talking about right at the beginning, the traditional sense of security, but at the same time, you've got to stay in step. Yes, and you know, if I, uh, I mean, there is risk everywhere. So if you... I mean, uh, Roche bought uh, Genentech uh, now uh, quite a few years ago, but had Roche not bought Genentech, I think you know the the future of Roche would have been very different from uh, from what it has uh, done. So you see, not only in tech, but you see in in uh, in any uh, industries, you see Nestle uh, repositioning itself towards healthier foods, uh, you know, selling their lower margin uh, business. Um, so I think. In every industry, uh, you have to constantly uh, make sure that you are you're well positioned to, uh, you know, to survive and to to grow in the next uh, decades. So it's not it's not easy. Yeah, no, it's not easy. And ESG, you know, and the social corporate social responsibility. How big is that in the minds of a the bank, but also your clients? Are you being pushed for it? Yes, it depends on the market. Um, I think on the in the institutional world, definitely a, a big uh, a big topic. I think the um, you know in England, in the US, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, it has become very big. Um, I think Switzerland is a bit behind, uh, if I if I may say, um, or on that um, from from a client point of view. So we start getting more and more questions about this. 
but I think it's quite new. I think uh, three, four years ago, there was not a lot of question in Switzerland when my colleagues in, in other markets like, like the UK were already facing uh, questions. And so I think we all need to do more on this. Um, and there is definitely a, you know, a willingness from Rothschild and Co. To, you know, to do more um, also there. Not only because it's the it's our, our clients are asking for it, uh, but I think it's just the right thing to you know to do. And uh, I think that you know we are quite credible um, when we speak speak about uh, ESG. I think that uh, we the industry has to be careful and not doing too much uh, and to to kind of uh, be credible when they speak to our clients. Yeah, no, I, I I think you're totally on the spot. And I see more and more of the big funds, you know, the Larry Fings of this world saying we're going yes. tooth combing our funds for, you know, the companies that greenwash, you know, yes. or, and, and, you know, uh, kick, kick out those that don't even have the slightest ESG angle. And I think this is where the world is going. So it will be maybe led through the actual investment by Picunia, as they say, but then the companies underneath from grassroots, they need to, they need to deliver. They need to deliver, and uh, there's more and more of that coming. And if you think about it, I mean, I'm surprised that this, you know the Swiss clients might be even behind the curve a little bit, pushing for it, because Global Balance Bank, I'm sure you know them, Laurent, they are here in Switzerland as well. I had them on the show, and this is a, is a bank, basically, that just invests in, that, uh, in, in the ESG-compliant you know, institutions, whatever. And and the, the the interesting part is that you can structure your portfolio with a CO2 footprint. And there's this gamification yeah. Of their of their website, have a look at them, and um, because as you as you kind of dial around the different assets or the different geographies, you can tell how or how not ESG compliant your particular portfolio is, and that is really quite spot on. And you know, with the blockchain technology getting into in, in, into the company's reality more and more, it will be traceable if you are greenwashing or not. If That's you right. Are, we we and and you know we see um, I would say that the next generation uh, of our clients pushing for for this uh, ESG. So uh, I think that a lot of this comes from the the, the kids um, of, yes. of our clients who are, who are pushing their their parents to to do more uh, to be more. Um, you know, environmentally uh, friendly to pay more attention where they invest. You know, to stop uh, buying bonds of, of companies that are not um, doing what what is right for for the environment. So we see definitely the next generation pushing for it. So you know, we need to be ready. And you need to listen. Exactly. I think leaders yeah. listen in that sense. And I love it because the whole thing is about succession. Because what is now, as you were saying, is the kids. If it, if it wasn't for the, the daughter of the guy who then published Harry Potter, Harry Potter was already in his bin, he told me. You know, it was my eight-year-old saying, Dad, I, I found this in the bin and I really like the story. And that was Harry Potter. And the rest is history. And I think the next generation and children must not be overlooked, actually. You know, listen to them because it's, it's quite pertinent. Um, and that sets really also Rothschild and Co. apart, I think. Uh, if I, if I look at the entire approach how you know tailored specialized and close you are to your to your clients and of course the succession is a big part of what you do as well in the global advisory uh, to, to to navigate from generation to generation okay last uh, couple of questions what would you say um, if i was your client right now i'm trying to become one at some point <laughs> <laughs> uh, say are the biggest opportunities for me when i when i bank with Rothschild and co you mean in the uh, market for, for yeah, investments? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, we, I mean, we, we remain overweight uh, equities. Uh, we think uh, that, uh, you know, you shouldn't have too much cash. You should just have cash to, to take advantage of a possible correction to add more, more to equities. We don't, like, uh, we don't like bonds because we think the, you know, the, the real yield is, um, is going to be negative. So, so we just like like equities, and uh, I'm not going to be very original, but we like equities. Uh, you know the the blue chips, as I mentioned before. You know technology, um, technology uh, in the U.S. Uh, we like cash flow. Um, you know cash cash flow positive uh, companies. You know light in capex. Um, we don't. We like banks in in the U.S. to a certain, certain extent because we feel that you know the uh, interest rates 
are going to go up uh, probably uh, by the end of next year uh, again, which would be beneficial for for uh, for uh, U.S. banks. Um, so you know, I would just continue to buy uh, blue chips um, using uh, dips in the markets uh, to add to that. And plus, as well in the private market, looking for good value companies and helping to yes. for them to. to but but that's them. that's that's also difficult huh? because we 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 see uh, you know companies uh, that we used to buy probably five years ago at uh, eleven times. Uh, Mm-hmm. 11 times a bit the the multiples have gone up so now it's it's closer to 15 20 times a bit uh, and so as there is a lot of money that has been raised you know in in the private markets there is a lot of competition for for the good deals so it's it's uh, that's why i think it's important to rely on on a good partner because otherwise you might end up overpaying for for private companies um with almost no revenues just uh, maybe a good idea and, and execution risk so i think uh, on the private market you have to also be uh, selective and uh, you know we see more opportunities in europe than in the us because in the us there is a lot of um there is a lot of uh, Money uh, the same deals, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I love what you're saying, you know, in terms of the valuation and looking also at your partners to mitigate that um, that risk. Because, you know, when we go in the markets and, and with our partnership and we buy into, into the company, we buy small. We always say we buy in and build up. So us, uh, we are not only invested in it, but we call ourselves operational investors. So our currency is expertise. So the execution risk you just mentioned, uh, Laurent, is something that we try to mitigate being there literally becoming yeah. a partner. So we just don't give them cash, but we give them the smartness and then earn sweat equity. So we gain, of course, by creating the company and making it, you know, from the groundwork stable in our scale, uh, in our scale up. And the co-investors that come with us into our deals, they see actually our team, our operational team as the risk mitigators saying, okay, the execution is looked after by seasoned veterans, if I think of my husband, you know, veterans of the industry that have, that have done nothing else but execution, be it supply chain, HR, scaling. And they say, okay, the, the faculty team is in there. So my private market, my private company investment is kind of, you know, in safer hands. Of course, there's always a big question mark, but this is so important what you're saying. Yeah, we can look at the, at the great, you know, unicorns, but uh, you know, is, is, are the groundwork stable? Do they really know yeah. how to build a company? And it doesn't matter if it's high tech or lipsticks. You need to build a company with people, with structured uh, processes. And this is what a lot of people don't, you know, tend to forget. That's right. Yeah. 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 The very, very last one. Noah, and then I let you go because I know we are on a clock here. Key learnings. I always ask that to my uh, conversation partners here on Mentory TV. And looking at your CV, what makes you really, really different is you come from a different field. You come from the hospitality business and uh, you studied at a very uh, renowned university. Um, And I wonder, what are the key learnings you learned there? You actually now apply also with your clients, because the hospitality, hospitality business, I mean, it would kill me. You know, you got somebody <laughs> shouting at you, going like, I'm so upset with your seven-star hotel. I'm still upset. And, well, yes, of course, sir. So what did, you, what did you learn when you apply right now? Um, uh, yes, so that's right. I, I come from the hospi- hospitality industry. Uh, that's what I studied. I think that at the end of the day, it's not so different um, because it's all about the clients. Uh, it's a private client. It's a person that you have in front of uh, of you, and you need to answer and uh, anticipate the needs of the um, of the clients. I think that the the advantage I uh, I have compared to uh, you know, to, to people who went to uh, university in St. Gallen uh, and, and study uh, financial, uh, uh, you know, topics uh, is that in, in the hospitality uh, world, you have to find a solution quickly uh, and you're a lot more, um, you know, practical and you just have to solve, uh, to solve the problem. So I, rem- I remember that one of my worst uh, day in business was um, in the U.S. when I worked in a hotel and the, um, the, there was a wedding um, in our hotel and the, 
the 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 flower shop had forgotten to prepare the flowers for the uh, for the wedding. Ooh, so ooh. I had to, I, I had to go and uh, tell the bride that there would be no uh, no flowers uh, for her wedding, uh, which was a much more traumatic experience than you know when I have to to call a client. Um, you know, and tell him that we are we are underperforming the, uh, the the markets, which we rarely do. I, I have to say, as well, because we have a good investment team. But um, I think that you know, you just have to be quick at finding solutions. So I went around the hotel, you know, g- grabbed all the flowers I could find, and uh, at the end of the day, there was plenty of flowers in the room, but it wasn't the flowers she wanted, and there was no no flower left in the in the rest of the hotel. But you know, you just you just I think a lot more yeah. um, improvise you know, hands on and, and yeah. improviser. Yeah. yeah, which yeah. you have to do, you know, with clients sometimes. So I hear there, and please correct me if I'm wrong now, empathy for the situation, for the human being. Yes. Then Probably, yeah. impro- improvise to solve. And what would you say would be the third lesson you're still applying, which you learned during that time? Uh, hands on. So I like to put my my hands in the in the, the flower pot, words, literally uh, in, the flower, in the flower <laughs> pot. Uh, I like to get uh, involved with you know my colleagues from investments or or you know, front office. I like that, and I, I like people. I like working with people. I can tell. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure, Laurent, to have you here. Great, great conversation. Thank you for having us. Super, super insight into what you do at Rothschild and Co., how you approach the closeness to your clients really, I think, sets you apart, miles apart from, you know, the resilience that the bank has shown for over, I think, 211 years by now. Yep. Um, and it is a global entity, very fine, fine people, but at the same time, people. And this is what I got uh, in you. Laurent, thank you so, so much uh, for being here. Thank you. And thank you, my dear Mentory TV community, for having joined us yet again for a great conversation, this time with the CEO of Rothschild and Co. Bank AG here in Zurich, Laurent Gagnebert. I hope to see you soon for the next conversation coming up very soon indeed. Bye.